Hey, Belongers, welcome to our celebration service. Whether you're looking at this in the morning or nighttime, on your break at your job, we're so glad you're here today. And uh, we count it a privilege to have you uh, watching us online and being part of on our, our online community. Hey, I want to just say to you, if you need to connect, you can, uh, you can text um, SF Connect to 94000, and that will be your way of connecting with us. Before we get started this morning, I want to tell you, I probably don't need to tell you, Easter is coming, right? Easter is coming, and I've been challenging you to go out and invite someone to Easter to join us. If you're going to watch online, to join us online with you for Easter Sunday. Now, here's one of the things you can do. You can have a watch party right there in your home for Easter Sunday. Take us and you can hook us up on your TV, have a watch party, maybe do a brunch there at your home on Sunday morning uh, or Sunday at noon or whenever you watch this. But we want you to invite someone to Easter. You can go online and you can go to sfsellingfields.com uh, slash Easter and you have invites right there that you can use to invite someone to join you either in person or online for Easter Sunday morning. Have a ton of stuff happening, but we want to specifically invite you to our 930 or 11 o'clock Easter uh, Sunday services. And if you're if you're around and you would want to come to Good Friday, we have a Good Friday service also on Friday at 7 o'clock p.m. So we're glad you're here. We just believe that the greatest thing that has ever happened to humankind is the res resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because it's the greatest event in history, we believe that we want to invite people to experience the resurrected Christ as he can become the Lord of their lives. So thank you for your encouragement and your engagement in our mission to help people uh, belong, believe, and become. Well, we continue our series today, In It to Win It, A Fight to the Finish. And we've been talking about a number of things. We've talked about the fact that the adversary has really quick hands, that he's a fighter, that he's in it to win it, and he would like nothing better than to TKO you and leave you uh, on the on the on, on the mat and joining him on the trash heap of eternity. We also talked about so because of that, we need to have what we call the belt of truth buckled around our waist. We talked about truth is uh, Jesus said, I'm the way I'm the truth. I'm the life. And so truth is very important. We've also talked about this idea that we need to have the breastplate of righteousness. And we talked about that righteousness is all about holy living, God honoring living. And that in order for us to, to put on the breastplate of righteousness, it's all about surrendering, tapping out, waving the white flag, throwing in the towel and saying, God, you are in charge of my life. Well, to begin today, I'm a shoe person. I, I just am. Now, I don't want anybody to know this, but I just might, I just might have more shoes than my wife has. You didn't hear that from me. Keep that, shh, keep that a secret. I'm a shoe person and I have all kinds of shoes. I don't know when I became a shoe person. I, I have the sneakers and I, so I have like, uh, you know, the leather sneakers that everybody wears with the white bottoms. I might have those in every color that, that's imaginable. I have a whole bunch of boots. I have a bunch of shoes. I have a bunch of regular sneakers. I have a whole bunch of sandals. I have a whole bunch of shoes. I think the last count, I was up to like 35 pair of shoes. I, I, like I said, I don't know when that happened, but it might have been that when I was young, I was born at one pound with a twin sister, one pound and a couple of ounces each. And one of the results of being born premature and having to uh, work through the premature thing is I had really bad feet. And because I had really bad feet, I wore these orthopedic shoes for until I was in second grade. Now imagine, imagine shoes that are leather. They are they were the half tops before we had half tops, right? You know we have half tops and sneakers for uh, a basketball. Before they were those half top sneakers, I had these orthopedic shoes. They were leather, and um and I had braces on my legs, and they had belt buckles. Kind of think of the shoes that pilgrim pilgrims wore. And so I had these brown orthopedic shoes that I had to wear until second grade. In fact, it wasn't until the second grade that I got my first pair of sneakers. Tennis shoes, we call them in the DMV, but sneakers is what most people call them. 
Think of, they weren't even gray sneakers. They weren't Jordans because Jordan was around then. They weren't Converse All-Stars. They were Maypops. Now, now you had to grow up in the DMV to understand what Maypops are. There used to be a song called Maypops. They cost $1.99. Maypops make you feel so bad. Anyway, they were Maypops, but they were my first pair of sneakers. And so I loved them whether they were Maypops or not. Maybe that's when I got into having shoes because I didn't have my own. I had to wear ones that were assigned to me until I was in second grade. Shoes are pretty important in this fight, in this fight to the finish that we are on. Shoes are really important. Now, maybe you didn't have to wear special shoes. Your feet may not have been flat. One of the reasons I had to wear the shoes is because I had really bad ankles and I had really flat feet. I mean, to, to this day, unless I have what you call a cookie or arch support, my feet are totally flat, all right? So maybe your feet are not totally flat, but the reality is this, we need shoes. In fact, if the truth were known, each of us uh, wear different shoes for different occasions, right? You might wear some dress shoes when you're going to a prom or something. You have sneakers, you have some shoes that you just kind of wear around the house. I have some Crocs for that. Maybe you have some sneakers that are worn out and you really, really like these sneakers and you won't get rid of them. But we have shoes for all different kinds of occasions. You know, we have casual shoes, yard shoes, Sunday morning shoes, workout shoes, golf shoes, high heel shoes, open toe shoes, flats, work boots, sandals, flip flops. I think you get the picture. We all have true shoes. The truth is our feet, our feet are important in our daily functioning of life. Without them, we can't walk, we can't run, we can't dance, we can't play sports. Our feet are very important also in this fight for life. We've been talking about how our feet and the positioning of our feet and how we move our feet are so important in this fight of life. All you have to do is injure your foot and you know how important your feet are. All you have to do is have a really bad bunion or an ingrown toenail that really hurts and you know how important your feet are. In this, uh, in this fight that we're in, our feet are really important in the fight. Any boxer would tell you that feet are extremely important. And so when they're training, they're just not training their arms and their upper body. They're also training their feet in their foot position. In the fight for your very soul, the way your feet are foot fitted make a difference. Because our, soul, our feet are so critical to our everyday living, to our everyday life, what happens with our feet is also critical for fighting. Shoes are uh, indispensable attire, indispensable for this fight that we're in. Shoes protect our feet from the warm, from the cold. I mean, shoes keep us from stepping on rocks and sharp objects that would hurt our feet. We need shoes. And when it comes to spiritual warfare, we even need shoes more than maybe we you, you need them in daily life. Because the spiritual forces of evil want to do our feet in to keep us off balance, to keep us from what we need to do. So in a boxing situation, they have shoes. Shoes that are designed specifically for boxing. You see that they have some height to them to protect your ankles, to make sure you have ankles. They have grips on them so that as you move around the ring, you are able to grip and to move really nicely. They tie up all the way to the top. Shoes are important in the boxing match, in a boxing match. But without the right shoes, you'd be out of luck. Without the right shoes, you would not be able to move quickly. You would not be able to duck and dodge, and you might just get kind of a TKO shot. Without the shoes, you might be in a situation when you're down for the count. The enemy knows about shoes. The enemy understands shoes. And he understands that if you and I don't have the right shoes on, we are out of luck. See, our feet carry us into the fight. Our feet are the things that walk us into the fight. And unless our feet have the right shoes, we're in big trouble. 
In Ephesians 6.15, God teaches us about the strategic important shoes play in our battle armor. Paul says this, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Let me say that again. He says, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. He didn't say just do it like Nike. He didn't talk about Adidas or Under Armour or Converse or K-Swiss shoes. Jesus commanded that our feet need to be fitted with the urgency or the readiness that comes from the message of the gospel of peace. When it comes to arming yourself against this cosmic battle that you and I are in, God commands you to be ready, putting on your fight shoes. In other words, you need gospel fitted feet, fitted feet with peace. So here's the question. What's the opposite? What's the opposite or the antonym for peace? Conflict. The gospel is the peace what Satan is to conflict. One of Satan's greatest battle tactics, one of his greatest fight tactics is to create conflict in the world. We want to, we, world, we live in relationship, vertical and horizontal, and God wants nothing more than for us to be able to live at peace in relationships, peace with him and peace with others. Right now, at this very moment throughout the world, and in many lives, even who are listening to me today, there's conflict. You have conflict in your life. Maybe a relationship that's gone bad. Maybe someone who's hurt you and you're not talking to them. But there's conflict in your life. God created us to enjoy relationships and peace, not in conflict. From the moment that Satan fell from heaven to the trash heap of eternity, he's been the author of of conflict in the world. I'm sure Satan thought he had won when he tricked Eve and Adam to eat the forbidden fruit. At the moment that Adam and Eve disobeyed God, conflict infected humanity through sin. And the result of this conflict is a total lack of spiritual peace between God and his crowning jewel of creation, humankind. So in one sense, there's a very there's a very intense vertical conflict going on between a holy God and sin that inf infects the world. Satan wants nothing more. I mean, he wants nothing more than for you to remain in spiritual conflict with God. He wants you to not be in relationship with God. He wants you and God at odds. Satan will do everything in his cosmic powers to thwart your reconciliation between God and humanity, between God and sinners. And on a, on a horizontal level, ever since sin entered the world, Satan has been attacking human relationships. It started with Cain and Abel. Remember the story? Cain and Abel both bringing their offerings to God. Abel brings an offering that pleases God because it's his first and his best. And Cain brings an offering that does not please God because he gives God the leftovers. And God accepts Abel's offering and does not accept Cain's offering. And because sin brought conflict in the world, Cain kills his brother Abel. Conflict. Ever since sin entered the world. So Satan attacks human relationships with great ferocity, hoping to produce gut-wrenching conflict that unresolved and unreconciled destroys nations and friendships and marriages and families. From the moment that sin infected man, Satan has stirred this cauldron of conflict, masterfully causing wars and uh, between allies, pitching friends against friends, family against family, tribes against tribe, nations against nations, with the result being a horrific, destructive pain and even death. If you want to see his mastery in destroying God's made relationships, just look at the marriage covenant. Just look at marriages in our world falling apart. Marriages that are destroyed and families that are destroyed because of conflict. We've been warned for weeks that Satan is a powerful foe. We've talked about it for weeks that, that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy He's in the fighting for keeps. 
throwing conflict jabs into our home, conflict jabs into the church, conflict jabs into our job and our family relationships with the express purpose of producing gut-wrenching conflict that destroys homes, that destroy relationships, and that destroy humanity. When it comes to spiritual warfare, how you handle conflict jabs and uppercuts will in large part determine whether or not you succeed in this spiritual area of fighting. When it comes to relational conflict, the key piece of spiritual armor is your shoes. Those shoes are the gospel piece. It doesn't take much spiritual discernment to scan the spiritual, you know, the spiritual fighting ring to see that too many Christians, far too many Christians, are fighting without their feet fitted with peace. Can you imagine entering a boxing ring barefooted? Can you imagine how the fight would go if you go in barefooted? How someone might step on your foot and then throw a punch? When we were growing up as kids, that's one of the tactics we used. When you were fighting, if you could step on the person's foot, you would throw them off balance and then you would throw a punch, right? Can you imagine going in the ring? Well, that's exactly what many of us are doing when we go into a ring without gospel fitted feet. When we're fighting barefoot, we're setting ourselves up for a TKO. Here's the bottom line. When it comes to fighting a good fight against cosmic powers and spiritual forces of evil, fight with the gospel of peace. Now, let me say this to you. For some of you, this seems like a paradox. Fighting with peace seems like it's a paradox and it's too hard for most of us to grasp. After all, most of us associate peace with passivity. We don't think of peace as being, uh, we don't think of it as being an offensive term. Few of us, if any of us, think of peace from the perspective of, okay, things are going to be all right. Yet the Christian paradox of spiritual warfare is that one of the most powerful weapons in warfare that we can use against the enemy is an aggressive pursuit of peace. So when I come back, we're going to talk about what this peace looks like that we're called to have our feet fitted with. See you in a second. All right. Glad you're back. If you're fighting barefooted, I mean, if you're entering the ring uh, with shoes that are not bringing the gospel of peace, then you're going to get a beat down. You will get pounded without the shoes of peace taking you into the fight. God wants you to fight. He's called you into the ring to defeat Satan's weapons of conflict with the overpowering weapons of peace. What exactly is the gospel of peace? I'm so glad you asked. The gospel of peace seeks reconciliation. It doesn't wait for it. Put differently, the gospel of peace is proactive, proactive, not reactive. God says through the apostle Paul, listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 5. Now we look inside and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone, a new life burgeons. Look at it. All of this is from God who settled the relationship between him and us and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he's doing. We're Christ, we're God's, we're Christ's representatives, or someone would say ambassadors, and God uses us to persuade women and men to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now, become friends with God, he's already a friend with you. This is the true on a vertical plane and a horizontal plane when it comes to conflict. From a vertical perspective, throughout the gospel, we read phrases like Jesus came, God sent. God sent peace to us through Jesus Christ. He didn't wait for us to bring a peace offering to him. God took the initiative on our behalf to bring peace. When it comes to the spiritual fight for our souls, 
the vertical fight between sin and God, we have been chosen and commanded by God to take the gospel into the world. We have been commanded to take the peace of Jesus Christ, which is salvation through him alone to those who have not yet been set free. Can I say that again? We've been commanded to take the gospel into the world. We've been commanded to take the peace of Jesus Christ, which is salvation to those who have not yet been set free. So when you think of the gospel of peace, think of what Jesus did, the birth, the death, the resurrection, and the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ that brings salvation. From a horizontal perspective, we're commanded to pursue peace in our relationships. Not to wait for someone to come make it right for us. What did the Bible say? If you're getting ready to go to the altar to take your offering, and you realize that you have something against someone, or someone has something against you, leave your offering there. Go and make that relationship right, and then come and bring your offering. The Apostle Paul says, and that's about it, friends. Be careful. Be cheerful. Keep things in good repair. Keep your spirits up. Think in harmony. Be agreeable. Do all that, and the God of love and peace will be with you for sure. We're called to take the initiative. We're called to take the gospel of peace. The world says, you know what? It's not your fault. It's not your fault. You wait for them. Don't you go to them. You wait for them to come to you. No. The Bible says that we're Christ's representatives. We're his ambassadors. And because he's vertically made things right between us and him, he calls us to go and make things right between us and others. Hebrews says it like this, work at getting along with each other and with God. Otherwise, you'll never get so much as a glimpse of God. Jesus had this to say as he addressed conflict between two people. This is what he says. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter, and here it is, I'm going to read the specific scripture that I alluded to earlier. If you enter your place of worship and are about to make an offering, and you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering, leave immediately, and go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work out things out with God. In other words, if, you, if you're going and you're uh, taking an offering, maybe it's an offering where you're saying, hey, God, you know what? I've done this. I need to confess this. I need to, I need to make this right between you and I. He says, leave that there. Make it right between you and your brother and sister first, and then come back and make it right with God. Do you want to be standing on your feet when all but the shouting is done? Then you've got to have gospel of peace fitted feet that will help you be a reconciler between people and God and in your own personal relationships. Refusing, deciding I'm not going to seek reconciliation, I'm not going to do this, is fighting barefooted, which means that you're going to lose. The gospel of peace extends grace, not judgment. The gospel of peace of God is, is, is extending grace toward the guilty. It, it, it says, you know what, you've messed up, but I'm going to give you grace because God has given me grace. Grace can be defined this way, extending unconditional love and forgiveness to someone when they deserve it to least. Extending unconditional love to someone and forgiveness to someone when they deserve it the least. Because that's exactly what God and Christ Jesus did for us. The Bible says when we are of no use whatsoever to God, Christ died for you and I. You know what that means? That means when before we were even thinking about God, before we even had God on our mind, in our mind, God had already sent Christ Jesus to forgive us, to love us to be a bridge back into relationship with him. God gives us what we don't deserve, an eternal relationship with Jesus, and not what I do, a place, what I do deserve and you deserve as well, a place in the trash heap of eternity. 
God loved us and forgave us through the gracious gift of Christ when we deserved it least. God says this, love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for itself. Love doesn't want what love doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. It doesn't have a swelled head. It doesn't force itself on others. It isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep a score of the sins of others. It doesn't ravel or, or it doesn't revel when others grovel. It takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. It puts up with anything. It trusts God always. It always looks for the best. It never looks back, but it keeps going to the end. Love never dies. You will never, listen to me here, you will never win the spiritual battle of your life unless your feet are fitted with the gospel of peace. And unless you extend people the grace and love that God in Christ Jesus extended to you and I, we will never win the battle. Satan wants nothing more than for you to withhold grace, for you to withhold forgiveness, for you to withhold reconciliation, because he knows that will keep you in conflict. It will keep you off balance. It will keep your feet from being fitted with the gospel of peace so he can throw the knockout punch and have you join him on the trash heap of eternity. Satan was nothing more for, than for you and I to pridefully refuse to love unconditionally by forgiving someone when they don't deserve it. Satan wants you and I to hold grudges. He wants us to judge. He wants us to, to have an attitude that's destructive. He wants the root of bitterness to choke off your life and my life to steal our joy and to wound our soul. He wants you to fly off the handle, to keep a, a score and, and, and when you face conflict. But God wants us to love, to love others the way he loved us in Christ Jesus. God wants us to be gracious. He wants our forgiveness to be unconditional. I'm not saying you don't have boundaries. But I'm saying when it comes to forgiveness, you forgive people the way God forgave you and I. In fact, the Bible says that if we won't forgive people their sins, then God won't forgive ours. What does that mean? I don't, I don't really think it means that God somehow is going to withhold his forgiveness. What it means is we will not be able to receive it because we can't receive what we don't give. Right now, some of you are battling intense conflict. Maybe you're here today and, you're so, and your soul, you're here and you're listening to me and you have no peace inside. Maybe you have all kinds of conflict and you're dealing with all kinds of stuff. God sent his son to die on a cross on Good Friday that peace would be restored between God and humanity. If there's no peace in your heart, if there's no peace in your soul, then Jesus Christ is the answer. Satan wants you to remain in conflict with God via sin. God wants you to place your faith in Jesus Christ and experience peace like you've never experienced before in your whole life. Maybe you're here today and you're listening to me and there's an intense conflict in your life via a relationship. Maybe your marriage is in the just in a total stranglehold and your marriage is in shambles and there's just no peace in your family. Maybe there's a friendship that's just deteriorating before your very eyes because of bitterness and conflict and unforgiving spirits. Whatever the relationship may be, God wants peace to reign victoriously in your life and in my life. Satan wants to destroy your relationships. But God wants your relationships to flourish because of unconditional love and forgiveness. Only the battle shoes, the gospel of peace, will bring victory. So let me ask you a question. Are you fighting the good fight? Are you fighting the good fight with peace-fitted shoes on your feet? Man, you can run into the battle. But one of your greatest weapons will be you taking the initiative to bring peace. Not just peace vertically, peace with God, 
peace because you're forgiven of your sins and you're in relationship with God. But peace also in your horizontal relationships. Remember, if there's conflict, it only comes from Satan. There is no conflict that God brings in relationship. I know we see on the news and we hear all the time and we're in conflict in the church. There is no conflict that God brings. Conflict comes from the evil one. God wants our feet fitted with the gospel of peace. He wants us to be people who reconcile the world back to him. So how are you doing with your feet? Are your feet fitted with the gospel of peace? Would you pray with me, Father God? Thank you that you provide this indispensable weapon for us. Lord, when, when the world talks about conflict and strife and anger and frustration and unforgiveness, you speak about what you've done for us in Christ Jesus. You took the initiative on our behalf And so you call your people who are in the fight for their lives to take the initiative in this gospel of peace that really is salvation. And so we're called to take your gospel, your message of salvation to the world. We're we're called to experience it ourselves and then take it to the world. There's nothing that quells conflict and strife and envy like salvation. So, Father, help us to fit our feet with the gospel of peace. Even as we think about Easter, what a great time to take the gospel of peace to people all around us. What a great time to invite someone to experience the God who will not only save their souls, but the God who took initiative by sending his son, Jesus, so that we might have life and more abundantly. Maybe you're listening to me today and you don't know anything about this salvation, this gospel of peace, this salvation that God made possible through Jesus Christ, birth, life, death, and resurrection. Today, to this very day, you can know the peace that happens by God's grace by trusting in Jesus Christ to be your Savior. You can pray a prayer of something like this. God, thank you. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Thank you for salvation. When I didn't deserve it, you, uh, you sent Jesus anyway to provide it for me by faith through grace. So, Father, I accept this gift today. I turn around. I ask you to forgive me for doing my own thing, for going my own way, and I turn around and walk in a different way. And I ask you to come and be the CEO of my life. Maybe here you're here today and you are a Christian and you've been around for a long time and maybe you would pray a prayer like this, God, I want to be your ambassador. I want to be your ambassador, helping to reconcile, to make the world right between you and humanity. Give me the words to say, help my feet to be fitted in such a way. Help me to go out and spread the good news of salvation. And then, Father, help me to be an example and model what it means to be at peace with all people around me. Thank you, Father, for what you're calling us to. Help us not to shrink back on this particular weapon, because that would be like going into the battle without shoes on. In your name we pray. Amen.